So there I was sitting with my phone yesterday. Got one of those uh, little blasts, the alerts that come across the phone. Kathy heard it. She looked at me and said, Will you put that phone down? <laughs> I think it's a whole different way from up. But I looked at it, and the, uh, the little alert said that the last known survivor of the 19th century died this past week. Emma Morano in Italy. She was born November 29, 1899. She was 117 years old. She was the last known human being on this planet at this time that was alive in the 1800s. So I'm sitting there thinking. After 117 years on this earth a lot, was she ready to die? I mean, when you die, have you made preparations for your burial? And when, have you made preparations for your resurrection? Around the turn of the 20th century, there lived a man by the name of Reuben John Smith. Smith was fond of the comforts of life. And since he had lived a very comfortable existence while he walked this earth, he thought it only proper to be prepared for a comfortable existence in the world to come. Thus, at his death, he left detailed instructions concerning his burial. He was to be buried in a new recliner chair of upholstered russet leather. He was to be in turn sit in a sitting position. And on his lap was to be placed a checkerboard. A practical man, Smith also ordered that he be dressed in a hat and a coat, and that a key to the tomb be placed in his coat pocket. Now that was a very interesting final touch, I think. A key to the tomb. Now as far as that is known, that key was never used. I wonder why. But I think this morning, that the key, real key is faith in Jesus Christ. At the death of Nikita uh, Khrushchev, the former leader of the Soviet Union many, many years ago, a humorous story circulated around political circles. You may remember the Communist Party. They had cast Mr. Khrushchev aside, and now that he was dead, they certainly were not looking favorably upon the idea of burying his body on Soviet soil. So they first called the President of the United States, who at that time was Richard Nixon, and asked if the United States would take Khrushchev's corpse. Nixon had problems of his own, and so he declined. <laughs> then the Soviet leaders tried Gola Meir. Prime Minister of Israel, Mrs. Meir, was agreeable. But she added, and I quote, I must warn you that this country has the world's highest resurrection rate. <laughs> well, she was right. Israel does have the world's highest resurrection rate. And in case you're curious to what the world's highest resurrection rate is, it's one. And that is why we're here today to celebrate the only one who has ever been able to resurrect himself. The time was Sunday morning, just before dawn. The setting and garden not too far away from that hill where Jesus had been so cruelly crucified. In the garden was a tomb, freshly hewn from rock. A, a giant stone once sealed that tomb, but that morning, in spite of an imperial seal that had been a fixed to that stone, and Roman centurions who had been placed there to guard the tomb, that giant stone no longer covered the entrance to the tomb. Some grief-stricken women, women had made their way to that lonely spot that morning, and of these women, John's Gospel identifies only Mary Magdalene. But if you turn to the other Gospels, you will discover that there was also Mary, the mother of James, Joanna, and Solomon. Undoubtedly, undoubtedly, the silence of the night and the solemnness of the occasion caused them to move very quietly, though briskly, towards the place where their Lord's body had been placed. 
They brought along with them spices with which to anoint Jesus' body, which had not been properly done on Friday on account of the fact that the burial had to be done in haste before the beginning of the Sabbath. It must have been disconcerting, perhaps even frightening, for the women to discover upon arrival that the stone that had been placed in front of the tomb had been moved. And the tomb was empty. Jesus' body was not there. Now what did it mean? And had his final resting place been desecrated by grave robbers? Did his enemies fear and despise him so much that even after he was dead, they had seized his broken body? The women quickly scattered to tell family and friends of this disturbing event. Mary rushed to inform Peter and John. Both men ran back to the tomb, but they were as mystified as Mary. The men returned to the safety and seclusion of their homes, but Mary remained, now alone, with her grief. And it says in the text that she stood weeping. She stood sobbing. She was almost bawling. It reminds me of when I stood before a congregation like this on the occasion of the funeral of my mother, and my eyes were so filled with water. She stood there just outside the entrance of the tomb. In vain desperation and hope of an answer, she stooped down and allowed herself one last look inside the burial hole. I mean, imagine her reaction when she saw two angels in white seated where Jesus' body had previously been, one at the head and one at the foot. And they asked her, woman, why are you crying? Well, I think they knew. They have taken away my Lord, she said, and I don't know where they have put him. And at this she turned around and she saw Jesus standing there, but did not realize at first that it was Jesus. He also asked her, woman, why are you crying? Again, really? Who is it for whom you are looking? Thinking he was a gardener, she said, sir, if you have carried him away, tell me where you have put him and I will get him. And Jesus said to her, Mary. And at the moment that he spoke, she recognized that voice from her past that had called out her name so many times previously. And she turned toward him and cried out in Arabic, Teacher! And whether the sun was just beginning to peep sleepily over the horizon of some nearby Judean hillside at that precise moment, we do not know. Or whether her eyes were just filled with all that moisture of which I spoke earlier, I do know that when I drive to work in the morning, I'm headed east, and the sun is just coming up over the horizon. It can be blinding, and I'm pretty sure Mary was not wearing sunglasses. <laughs> but her tear-swollen eyes, combined with pre-dawn darkness or brightness, could explain Mary's failure to recognize Jesus immediately. Undoubtedly, however, when he called her name, <coughs> There was a sunrise in Mary's heart. With a sudden surge of emotion, she sought to embrace him. I mean, wouldn't you? It was the natural response of deep and grateful love. It was Jesus who had made a new woman of Mary Magdalene. She was so appreciative of all that Jesus had done for her. And in one moment, he was missing. In the next moment, he was standing right there in front of her. Impulsively, she reached for him. What are you? And Jesus stopped her with the explanation that he had not as of yet ascended to the Father. And Mary Magdalene, Magdalene will at that moment have to be content to hold Jesus in her heart. And that is exactly what she did. Later, she would testify to his disciples, I have seen the Lord. And so I asked her, what does Mary Magdalene's experience on that very first Easter Sunday have to do with your life and with mine? Are there tombs in our lives in the which we may be peering right now or in some other moment of our life with a sense of hopelessness, helplessness, and despair? Is there a sense in which each of us can come through a crisis of doubt or uncertainty and be able to proclaim victoriously all the way through, I have seen the Lord. 
In other words, no matter what hand life has dealt you, as Jesus transformed your life, we should know, first of all, the sense of hopelessness that enshrouded all those who followed Jesus after his crucifixion. I mean, if actions speak louder than words, those first disciples made it abundantly clear that they no longer believed that Jesus was the hope of the world, as was prophesied by the prophet Zechariah and then picked up and enforced by Jesus himself in a cowardly fashion the disciples had scattered. They were in darkness, and they were without hope. Have you ever been there? In contrast, Easter Sunday, or better yet, Resurrection Sunday, is a day of bright colors. I mean, just look at these beautiful flowers, joyful music, enthusiastic worship. We cannot appreciate, however, the Easter message if we cannot first understand that the first Easter was born in total darkness. Jesus' disciples had believed that he was the Messiah who had come to deliver Israel, but now he lay in a borrowed grave, dead. His side with a deep gash from a spear, his hands and feet disfigured with the marks of nails, his brow a tangled mess of hair and dried blood, where the crown of thorns had once mocked his supposed kingship, his back a terrifying grid of open wounds, from 39 lashes. And one did not want to see a dog die like Jesus had died. There was no dignity in it at all. He hung there on the cross like a criminal, naked, while soldiers jeered him and spit upon him. I mean, where were the 10,000 angels who could come at his beck and call? His followers now were cowering behind closed doors, their emotions a mixture of cynicism and despair. Perhaps you've been there. Maybe you've lived for a while behind closed doors without hope, in despair. I mean, many good people have. I was reading recently about a young lawyer who descended into the valley of hopelessness. Things were going so poorly for this lawyer that his friends thought it best to keep all knives and razors away from him for fear of a suicide attempt. In fact, during this dark time, he felt that his life was useless, that nothing of any good would ever come out of his life. He was an utter and complete failure. He wrote in his memoirs, I'm now the most miserable man living. Whether I shall ever be better, I cannot tell. I fear I shall not. Now the young lawyer who unleashed these desperate feelings of utter hopelessness, his name was Abraham Lincoln. The two nights following Jesus' crucifixion were the longest nights that those who loved him so very much would ever endure. Perhaps you have gone through such kind of long nights yourself. The words of a doctor, I'm sorry, it's malignant. There's nothing we can do. Phone call in the middle of the night, Mrs. Jones, there has been a terrible accident. Uh, you must come to the hospital quickly. <coughs> the words of your accountant, Bill, if you sell your assets now, you might be able to recoup just part of your investment. Otherwise, you stand to lose everything. A parent to a young child, you know your mommy and daddy have not been getting along well lately. We've decided to, to try living apart for a while. Many of you, if not all of us, have had at some moment of time our own dark night. Then it is that we must remember that Easter was not born in the brightness of a noonday sun. No, the women came to the tomb while it was still dark. But listen, there is good news, my friends. There is always hope, and we need to know that there is someone to trust in the darkness. For help and hope is always closer than we think. The darkness of a present moment and our tear-swollen eyes may blind us to a friend who is standing quietly in the shadows nearby. In that first Easter, softly, Jesus asked, Mary, why are you weeping? But the same is true of us today. In the midst of our hurts and in the midst of our pain and our darkness and in our despair, Jesus compassionately asks us, 
Woman, why are you weeping? Sir, why are you in such despair? And after listening to our complaint, he whispers our name. Linda, Emily, Jim, Mary, Jack, John, Jean, whatever your name may be. And we recognize at that moment that Jesus has been there all the time. He is not dead. He is alive. He is there for us. He is our hope. He is our victory. Christ is alive. And because he is alive, we discover that the sun rises again and the birds, in fact, do sing. And joy begins to creep back into our life. All of nature speaks of such possibility. The rhythm of nature declares not only the glory of God, but the victory of hope over despair, of light over darkness, of joy over fear, of life over death. That remarkable naturalist poet, Lauren Isley, once put it so beautifully, he said that we live in a world where even a spider refuses to lie down and die if a rope can still be spun to a star. New life appears all about us as spring bursts into full blossom. The blossoms that appear on the cactus at this time of season seem for us a season of, of replacing a season of lifelessness and wrath with a season of new life. As God whispers to us, you can make it through. I'm nearer than you can imagine. I will not let you fall. You know, if you've attended any of my Bible studies, at times I talk about where I was when I was a teenager, when I was 16. I was one of the most selfish, most self-centered people on the face of the earth. And without God in my life calling out my name and transforming my life, I would still be there, I'm sure, and I would be much worse than that. It was God who made a difference in my life. He introduced me to Jesus Christ, his son, who went to the cross and died for me, that I might give to him all the wretchedness of my life and to turn it around, to transform me, to make me into a new person altogether. In fact, here's the bottom line. The transformation of God's love and grace in our life is to make us more like Christ. We are to imitate God by walking in love with Christ's sacrifice on the cross as our great example. For the Father's great love is the kind of experience that should grow stronger and stronger in us over the years until it totally dominates every aspect of our living. It should consume our thoughts. It should control our behavior. It should motivate us to serve God and to live holy lives. It should give us comfort in the midst of our trials. It should fill us with eager hope of being with him in heaven for all eternity. It should fill us with awe and worship that he, the holy sovereign of the universe, would set his love on a sinful, self-willed rebel like me. <coughs> Most likely like me. Amazing love. How can it be that thou, my God, should die for me? Don't let yourself ever hear the fathers of the Father's great love and think, oh, mom. God's love all to always obeys us. As Christ was resurrected from the grave, so may you and I experience new life through him. For this is the gift that he longs to give each of us. It's the opportunity to experience victorious living here and now, as well as then and there forever. Tim Zingal tells about a pastor standing at the door of the church on Easter Sunday. When a woman comes by, he's never seen her before, and who says to the pastor, I've never seen such a crowd like this at church. The pastor didn't know her, but apparently she was impressed by the number of people in church on Easter Sunday. And then as she was shaking the pastor's hand and moving towards the outside of the church, she added, do you suppose it will make any difference? And he held on to her hand at that moment, then my letter get away. What do you mean, he said. Will what make any difference to when she shot back Easter? Will Easter make any difference for all these people, or will life tomorrow be the same as it was yesterday? It certainly made a difference in my life, my friend. 
friends. I hope it has made a difference in your life. It certainly made a difference in the lives of the first disciples. They knew that Christ had conquered death, and that caused them to give up everything they had, including their own lives, to get the word out to proclaim the good news. The question for us here today is, has Easter made a difference in your life? Are you peering anxiously into an empty tomb this morning? Don't give up. There is a Savior closer than you think. He is calling your name. He is offering you a gift. It is a gift of abundant life, both now and eternal life then. And it is available to you if you will realize that Christ gave his life for you, that you might live your life for him. Amen.